what in the world makes us so embarrassed about the gospel? For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And they were ministering to the Lord, and they were fasting, and the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. They fasted, prayed, laid hands on them, sent them away. That's the first missionary journey. Now Paul and Barnabas go on the first missionary journey to the world. They go down to Seleucia, verse 4, sail to Cyprus. When they reached uh, Salamis, they began to proclaim the Word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they also had, guess who? John Mark as their what? Helper. That's the operative word to understand this man. He is a helper. He had proven to be helpful to them in the time that they had used him in um, Antioch. I don't know. We don't know exactly how much time had gone on. But he had proved to be so helpful to them there that they decided to take him with them on the first missionary journey. That, by the way, friends, is the only description of him that tells us anything about the kind of ministry that he had. He was a helper. So they took him along. Uh, it wasn't easy, tough ministry. They ran into uh, Elimus the magician in verse 8 who was opposing them. It was tough. He was identified as one uh, full of deceit, son of the devil, verse 10, enemy of righteousness. And there was a miraculous handling of Him in verse 11. So right from the very beginning it was tough going, tough travel and opposition. Come down to verse 13, Paul and his companions put out to sea from Paphos, came to Perga in Pamphylia, John left them, returned to Jerusalem. This is a sad moment a deserter. He left them. He disappeared. He disappears from the New Testament record, by the way, for a few years. He left. And he didn't go back to Antioch. That wouldn't sit well with the Antiochian church that sent him out trusting he would serve the two preachers. So he went to Jerusalem. He disappears for a few years. The next time he's on the scene is in chapter 15. Turn to chapter 15, verse 36. A few years have passed. Um, John Mark hasn't been an issue because he's not around. But Paul has not forgotten his defection, his desertion, his cowardice. His cowardice, I should say, his weakness. They have a conversation in verse 36. They've come back from the first journey. They've given the full report of what God did on their first missionary journey. Time has gone by. Paul finally says to Barnabas, after some time has passed, let's return, visit the brethren in every city. Let's go on the second missionary journey, go back to the places where we founded the church, planted the church, proclaimed the Word of the Lord, and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, called Mark, along with him also. But Paul kept insisting, which means Barnabas kept insisting. They both kept in insisting, Barnabas, I want to take John Mark, I want to take John Mark. Paul kept insisting, I'm not taking John Mark, I am not taking John Mark. He insisted that they should not take him along who had, and here's the operative word, deserted. That's the only way to define what had happened. There's no reason given for His leaving in chapter 13. There's no rhyme or reason for it in that context. But here we learn He was a deserter. He deserted them in Pamphylia and hadn't gone with them to the work. The discussion got so heated it became what verse 39 calls a sharp disagreement. 
so sharp that not only did John Mark's cowardice cause him to have a relationship severed with Paul, but it caused Paul to have a severed relationship with his companion Barnabas. So Barnabas took Mark with him and went on a trip to Cyprus, where he was from, to, to proclaim the gospel there. Paul chose Silas to take Barnabas' place and traveled through, verse 41 says, Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Paul's refusal to take John Mark was legitimate. He didn't trust him. He had showed he lacked courage, strength, commitment. He was a defector. He was a deserter. Barnabas, by the way, takes John Mark. And Barnabas disappears for two years in the history. We don't know where, where he is for two years. John Mark disappears for ten years, ten years. Ten years later, he shows up again. Turn to Colossians 4. His name shows up in a letter written from Paul to the church at Colossae. By the way, Paul is in Rome when he writes this letter. When he was in Rome the first time as a prisoner, and he had two imprisonments, the first time, and then he was released, and then he had ministry, and then he was imprisoned again in Rome a second time, and he was martyred. This is the first imprisonment. He is in his first imprisonment in Rome, and he writes three letters, Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon. Chapter 4, verse 10, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, he's a prisoner in Rome. From prison he writes these letters, including this one, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, another believer in prison, sends you his greeting, and also Barnabas' cousin Mark. Wow! Ten years later, Paul's a prisoner in Rome, and guess who's his companion? The defector, Mark about whom you received instruction, if He comes to you, welcome Him." Well, something dramatic has taken place, something dramatic. In his letter to Philemon, verse 23, at the end of that letter, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you, as do Mark and Luke and some others. Here we are ten years later, Paul is in Rome, Mark is in Rome with Paul again. And Paul says, I'm sending Mark on my behalf. When he gets there, welcome him. He's back in the good graces of Paul. How long did that relationship last? Turn to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, Paul wrote from his second imprisonment some years later. It's, it's his last letter, 66, 67 A.D., 22, 23 years since the incident of Peter's release from prison. This is the end for him. He says, I'm ready to be offered. Time of my departure is at hand. He's going to have his head chopped off, and he did. But he has this last letter to Timothy. Verse 9, he says to Timothy, make every effort to come to me soon. Come. I want your fellowship, Timothy. Why? Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me. He had another deserter. Demas, he's gone to Thessalonica. Crescens, he's gone to Galatia. Titus, he's gone to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. And then he tells Timothy, do this, pick up whom? Mark. Bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. From the time of his first imprisonment, he had Mark at his side. 
A few years later, in his second imprisonment on the brink of his death, he wanted Mark with him. So I say to you, this is the story of the restored deserter. What kind of privilege is that, folks? What kind of privilege is that? For a guy who's not an apostle, not a prophet, not a pastor, not a teacher, not an evangelist, not a leader, just a helper, to be given the privilege of serving alongside the apostle Paul, defecting from that privilege and being restored years later to become so intimately associated with Paul, so loved by Paul, so trusted by Paul that Paul would send him to the Colossian church on his own behalf and that when Paul is facing death at the end of his life, the one person he asks to come in addition to Timothy is bring Mark. You're not surprised by that, are you, that the Lord would use people like that? Those are the only kind of people there are recovering sinners, restored deserters, recovered defectors. Now that part of the story is interesting, isn't it? His relationship to Paul is monumental. Can't imagine a simple, humble helper being an intimate friend and companion of the great apostle Paul. But. His relationship to another apostle is far more significant. That other apostle is Peter. Certainly it would be the privilege of all privileges for a failure, defector, deserter, rejected by Paul to be restored in grace to become the helper and friend of that marvelous man. How could he expect that kind of honor? But he had even more than that. He became the companion and confidant of Peter. If Paul was the greatest apostle in terms of the volume of things that he wrote, Peter was Christ's most intimate friend. What kind of privilege would it be to spend years alongside Paul and years alongside Peter? Did he know Peter? Sure he knew Peter. Peter had come to his house many times in the years of the early church. Had he heard Peter preach? Absolutely he heard Peter preach. But it wasn't the early acquaintance with Peter that was so significant. It was the later acquaintance with Peter. Remember those ten years when John Mark disappears? Part of the time he was with Peter. You remember when he left, he went back to Jerusalem? He didn't stay in Jerusalem. Peter took him somewhere. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 5 and I'll tell you where. 1 Peter chapter 5. Peter writes his letter that we know as 1 Peter, his first general epistle. And he is in Rome when he wrote this letter. Peter is. He is in Rome. He is writing in Rome to the Roman believers and others beyond. He makes reference to Rome in chapter 5, verse 13. She, meaning the church, who is in Babylon. That's a code word for Rome. And the reason he uses a code word is because persecution has begun to break out, severe, deadly persecution. And so in a cryptic way, he substitutes Babylon for Rome so as not to exacerbate the persecution. She, the church, chosen together with you who is in Babylon or Rome, sends you greetings. The greetings extend from the church in Rome to the other churches that will read the letter. And so does my son Mark. My son Mark? Oh, not his physical son, but his spiritual son. No doubt Mark had come to Christ listening to Peter preach way back when he was young. No doubt Peter was the first great impactful spiritual influence on his young life. Peter was responsible for his conversion. There is consistent historical testimony that goes all the way back to the first century that after Paul left his first imprisonment in Rome. After he had been there with Mark, 
After he had written Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon, he left Rome, was let out of prison, came back at a later time, but in the middle period of time, Peter went to Rome. Peter went to Rome. The consistent historical testimony is that Peter spent at least a year there, maybe more than a year, and he was in Rome and he was preaching constantly the gospel day after day after day after day. He died in Rome as a martyr in the summer or the autumn of the year 64 A.D., right at the time Nero burned the city and blamed the Christians and launched the persecution. And while Peter was there, he sends greetings. And he says, so does my son Mark. Mark was with Peter in Rome. Can you imagine being the companion of the Apostle Paul? That, enough, that would be enough. But then to be the companion of Peter? And he was just an astonishing privilege. He wrote it from Rome, and he was in Rome with Peter. You say, why is that important? Why does that matter? Because Mark's gospel is the product of Peter's eyewitness testimony. The source for Mark from a human viewpoint is Peter. His gospel is based on Peter's eyewitness accounts of the life of the Lord Jesus, which Peter rehearsed day after day after day after day as he went out into the streets and the buildings of Rome and preached the gospel with Mark at his side. And believe me, Mark had heard it before that, going all the way back to his childhood. This is Peter's account through John Mark. Not an apostle, not a prophet, not a pastor, not a leader, not a teacher, just a helper. He is given this immense, incredible privilege of writing what he calls the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit who controlled all the information that had come to him through Peter, he wrote this gospel. Matthew, a former tax collector. Luke, a Gentile, John, a brash son of thunder, and Mark, a defector. And you ask, why did the Lord choose those people? Because those are the only kind of people there are, sinful, unqualified people, forgiven sinners to choose from. You say, but are we sure John Mark is the author, since his name isn't in the gospel? Universal church testimony going back to the first century. At the top of each gospel in the original manuscript, it says kata matayon, kata markon, kata lukon, kata yohanan. According to Matthew, according to Mark, according to Luke, according to John. The title according to goes way back before the early church fathers. It was unequivocally affirmed, never disputed, never debated. And the ancient writers actually say that Mark wrote from material he heard from Peter. In fact, the testimony goes on. It's wonderful testimony. Somebody like uh, Polycarp, Polycarp, one of the early church fathers who knew John, had a student by the name of Papias who wrote Mark who was an interpreter of Peter, wrote with exactness. You have Justin, lives from 100 to 150 in his famous dialogue with Trypho, speaks of the memoirs of Peter being the gospel of Mark. He says Mark wrote in Rome after Peter's death. You have Irenaeus around 200. You have Origen around 230. Clement the year 300, Eusebius, 362, they all say the same thing. Here's a quote from Eusebius, "'So great a light of religion shone upon the minds of the hearers of Peter that they were not satisfied with a single hearing or with the unwritten teaching of the divine proclamation, but with all kinds of entreaties urged Mark, whose gospel is extant, seeing that he was a follower of Peter, to leave them in writing a record of the teaching transmitted to them orally, nor did they cease until they had prevailed upon the man, and so they became responsible humanly for the Scripture that is called the gospel according to Mark." 
They prevailed upon Mark to write it down. This is the true authentic work of John Mark. Inspired by the Holy Spirit, protected, controlled to be inerrant revelation concerning the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's only the beginning of the story, only the beginning, and that's how it starts. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the ending hasn't been written yet. This is just the very, very beginning. And in fact, it ends in a very strange way. The legitimate ending is in chapter 16, verse 8. That's where it really stops. And to show you how much a beginning without an end it is, here is the last verse of Mark. Just listen. They went out, fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had gripped them. They said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. End. In fact, that is such a strange ending that a false ending was added later, which you'll see in brackets in your Bible. It doesn't appear in the early manuscripts. But that's so consistent with Mark. This is the beginning. This is not the end. The story has no end. If you want the rest of the story, go to the book of Acts. It was written from Rome to Roman Christians. It is the memoirs of Peter. We know it was written to Gentiles because of its Gentile character. Jewish material is always explained because the Gentiles didn't understand it. We'll see that as we go through. There is no genealogy because Gentiles didn't care about a Jewish genealogy. There are Latinisms all through Mark because the Romans spoke Latin. Whenever there's an Aramaic term, it is explained because they wouldn't know it. They don't speak Aramaic. When they refer to time, chapter 6, verse 48, chapter 13, verse 35, it's Roman time. The style of Mark is fast-paced like a sprint, no introduction, no conclusion. It's just the beginning. The content focuses on action, very few teaching sections, chapter 4, chapter 13, a few teaching spots scattered around here and there, but mostly it's action intended to be read aloud, experienced by the hearers, the theme. Is Jesus Christ the Son of God? The structure, real simple, there's a midpoint in the book. Sixteen chapters, go to the middle, chapter 8, verse 29, and right in the middle of the book you hear this confession from Peter, you are the Christ. That is the pinnacle confession of the book. Everything in the front leads up to it, everything in the back goes from it. The front half proves Jesus is the Christ by His deeds and words. The second half proves Jesus is the Christ by His death and resurrection. But everything moves to that pinnacle that He is the Christ. The goal of the book is for you to confess that Jesus is the Christ. It has the same objective as John who writes in John 20, 31, these things are written that you may believe and believing have life in His name. It's an evangelistic book. The first half is filled with confusion. The people are confused. In fact, the only people who aren't confused about Jesus in the first half of Mark are the demons. In the second half, it's not confusion, it's hostility. But the pinnacle is the confession of Peter. And isn't that what you'd expect from one who was a disciple of Peter, one who drew his gospel from Peter? He would make Peter's confession, which Peter must have given every day that he was with Mark when he preached. He must have said, I believe He is the Christ. I'll tell you the story. One day we were here and Jesus said, who do men think I am? And we said, you're Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And then all of a sudden out of nowhere, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's what I said. That's what I believe. That's the pinnacle of Peter's testimony and that's the pinnacle of the gospel of Mark. And it's to bring all of us to that conviction. What a privilege for this helper, the most unlikely of people. In fact, if I redo 12 ordinary men, I'll change it to 13 ordinary men, throw Mark in there as an appendix, a very ordinary man. And God gave him privilege beyond calculation to be an intimate companion of Paul, an intimate companion of Peter, helping both of them. But beyond that, giving him the privilege to write one of four inspired gospels. Don't underestimate what God is able to do with helpers. Father, we thank You for this wonderful 
testimony to Your grace that's bound up in the heart of this man in his life. We're, we're thrilled to, uh, to be his students now as we embark upon the story as he told it and as You directed him. We're just so blessed, Lord, so blessed to have another opportunity to look at the life of Christ, to, to be caught up in the glory of His person, His work, His words, His ways, to walk with Him through the world, to see His life from another angle. What a privilege. Christ is all in all to us. He is everything to us. He is our life. We thank You that we see in, in this juxtaposition between the all-glorious Christ and Mark a distinction that's part of our own lives. Here is a gospel written about the sinless Son of God by a sinful man, written about the almighty, courageous, strong Son of God by a cowardly, weak man. Here is the story of a sinless one written by a sinner. Here is the story of perfect righteousness written by a man in desperate need of grace. Lord, we thank You that You use people like us because that's all there are is sinful people. Thank You for such mighty grace. Thank You that through history You have used helpers in such amazing ways. It's a privilege for us, Lord, to be the beneficiaries of this great work that You did through this remarkable man. We know nothing about him. We know the name of his mother and that he was a helper, a recovered sinner who was found useful. That's all we need to know. That's what we desire. Restore us, forgive us, make us useful, we pray. In Your Son's name, amen.